Today on Earth Focus, the links between biodiversity, climate change, and human health. An interview with Harvard Medical School pediatrician, Dr. Aaron Bernstein, coming up on Earth Focus. Human health is inseparable from the health of the natural world. Why did you write that? Well, it turns out that uh, our health depends on the diversity of life on Earth in pretty much every conceivable way, from the medicines we take to whether or not we may get certain infections, to the food we eat, to the water we need to survive. All of these foundations of what makes us healthy derive from the diversity of life. Can you give some examples that average people might not be familiar with? If you look at the 100 most prescribed medicines in the United States, about half of them are so-called natural products, meaning that they um, were sourced from species. Um, this includes drugs like the statins, which are widely used all over the world. Those come from a fungus, uh, to beta blockers, which are used for high blood pressure and certain irregular heartbeats, certain drugs for diabetes, like uh, metformin, and certainly insulin um, is a natural product. If you look at all of the new drugs that were approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration between 1981 and 2006, almost two-thirds of those would have had their origins in nature, not in a lab. There's a drug called rapamycin, and this drug is used in transplant patients. It's also used on uh, so-called coronary artery stents. These are little mesh tubes that get put into the blood vessels that supply uh, the heart with oxygen, and uh, they're put in after people have heart attacks and the artery gets clogged off. Um, rapamycin comes from a soil microbe on Easter Island, and uh, it has become incredibly useful. But it turns out that its value to medicine is far greater than as a drug. We uh, were able to understand a part of how our cells know when to divide because of this drug. So there's a protein in every cell that uh, is called the molecular target of rapamycin, or mTOR for short. And we only discovered this protein because we found this molecule in nature. And this protein is a gatekeeper for when the cell knows when to divide. And so sometimes because nature works through trial and error um, as it tries to figure out how to deal with all the challenges that come up. It can come up with solutions or molecules that no rational person might conceive of. And those sorts of innovations can be tremendously valuable to medicine like rapamycin. And right now we're seeing a lot of species moving towards extinction. That means we're losing opportunities for new medicines? The two biggest drivers of biodiversity loss are habitat loss, which can result from the clearing of forests or native habitats. And running a close second now is climate change. And you can quickly realize how warming of the planet and changing the way the water cycle on the planet works, which are two of the consequences of greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change, could affect the ability of species to live. Uh, for one thing, cold-blooded species have to maintain their body temperatures um, by uh, staying out of the heat. And if it's getting warmer, that forces them to move. And in fact, right now, we're, wi we're witnessing, we're living through a mass migration of species towards the poles of the planet, those that can get out of the heat. But there may be other more subtle ways in which climate change can force species extinctions. Um, for example, many uh, species have co-evolved relationships so that one species is dependent upon the other. And this might, for example, involve a flower and a migratory bird that uh, is required to pollinate the flower. Uh, flowers tend to bloom based upon temperature, so temperature is a major cue. But migration patterns may have less to do with temperature and more to do with sun cycles so that the bird migration gets out of sync. And so these so-called decoupling events are another mechanism through which climate change may cause biodiversity loss. But our best estimates today are that roughly 30% of land-based species are at risk of extinction from climate change alone by century's end. We really do depend upon this diversity of life for our well-being. And so I, as a pediatrician, see this loss of, of life as a major concern for our health. 
and it's our own doing. It is largely our own doing, and as such, we have the capacity to undo it. Why are so many of us unable to see what we're doing or unwilling to change it? I believe that at the core of what is leading to this loss of life is the disconnect that most people, too many of us, have with nature. So as you know, more people today than ever are living in cities and living in places in which nature is literally out of sight. And it becomes a great challenge for people to understand the relevance of this diversity of life to their everyday lives when they literally can't see it. And not only can they not see it, but they have a very hard time seeing how their consumption of the planet's resources affects this life because their wastes are shipped far and away out of sight as well. Is there anything that can be said or done to make people focus on this and perhaps change their behavior? So when you ask what, what are the messages that need to be out there, I think for some people it's letting them know that if you're on a medication, particularly for cancer or uh, an infectious disease, it's a very good chance that those medicines which are saving your life wouldn't exist if it weren't for nature. A more diverse population of animals in forests serves to buffer against the risk of contracting Lyme disease among the ticks that transmit it. In New England, where I'm from, the forests are less diverse than they used to be. And because of that loss of diversity, we are changing the risk of getting Lyme disease. Uh, in other parts of the country, um, we have tremendous problems with invasive species. Uh, the Great Lakes ecosystem has been fundamentally transformed by an invasive species known as the zebra mussel. And that has totally changed the species that live in the Great Lakes. One of the consequences of that ecological change is that it has made the environment of the Great Lakes more suitable to harmful algal blooms. We, uh, this summer, have seen the largest algal, harmful algal bloom in Lake Erie on record. Um, harmful algal blooms, in the case of the Great Lakes, include species of algae that produce pretty potent toxins. Some of them can affect the liver, um, and uh, if ingested, can, can cause serious illness. You mentioned Lyme disease as an example of a disease that's increasing as biodiversity diminishes. Are there other examples of other diseases? The way that Lyme disease works, as I explained it, where you reduce the diversity of animals that can serve as so-called reservoirs for the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, is that, that whole set of uh, circumstances is called the, uh, the dilution effect. So that it's the diversity of these species that dilutes the bacteria in the forest ecosystem. And the dilution effect has now actually been shown to operate with West Nile virus, which is a virus that, as you likely know, um, came into the United States almost a decade ago now um, and spread rapidly across the country and dramatically altered the diversity of bird species in parts of the country. But the same property of, of having an increased diversity of reservoir species, in this case birds, is a buffer against West Nile risk. Um, in fact, there may be several other infectious diseases where this phenomenon holds true. So a robust biodiversity is an important line of defense. Certainly when it comes to our food, um, when it comes to um, our, our sources of medicines, um, when it comes to the risks of us getting certain infectious diseases, we may be able to afford no better insurance for our health than uh, protecting the diversity of life we have. Speaking as a pediatrician, what impact do you think climate change is going to have on your medical practice 10 years down the road? So uh, with climate change in particular, um, we're already seeing uh, effects upon the health of people around the world and also in the health of children. So for example, uh, carbon dioxide itself is a stimulant to the production of pollen. And uh, under the influence of the carbon dioxide we've already added to the atmosphere, we've increased the pollen season in New England by at least a month and by some estimates more over the last several decades alone. And that, of course, is a major trigger. Pollen is a major trigger for allergic diseases like asthma and seasonal allergies. But at a larger scale, climate change is a significant issue because it is going to uh, already has and, and is likely to continue to increase 
the severity of extreme storms and droughts. And we already have some preliminary data from kids who survived Katrina and other disasters that these experiences are traumatic and have uh, effects across the lifespan. So you say, never mind for the moment the science that's piling up, but when people feel a threat to their own health, that will be the spur. Knowledge in the absence of understanding uh, doesn't get us far enough. We both have to understand that science is telling us that we are losing this diversity of life. And that loss is directly influencing our ability to lead healthy lives. And when those two come together, that's the source of motivation that I think we need. Dr. Bernstein, thank you very much. You're welcome. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.